Hello, dear faculty, dear participants. I would like to say Buenos dias, South America. And uh, I would like to say good evening, Europe. And uh, bonsoir, Europe. And I would also like to say Dobry vecher, Russia. And I would also like to greet all the countries who joined us today for this very uh, important event, uh, the webinar uh, in the series of the webinars, uh, which is titled um, um, Evidence-Based but Clinically Guided Pharmacotherapy for Major Psychosis. And it's our honor and good luck to have leading experts in the fields of major psychosis today with us. The webinar is supported by a World Health Organization and by Aristotle University of the Saloniki and a Master of Science program, uh, Clinical Mental Health, guided by Professor uh, Kostas Fontolakis. And first of all, we will start with the greetings, but I would like to um, give some introduction to participants that we will move from one speaker to another. And you can use uh, the option, the Zoom option, question and answers, which you can see down in the screen. And you can put all your questions and write down all your questions there. Uh, and address them to the speakers. And uh, first of all, I would like to introduce uh, Professor Abzal Javed, who is uh, World Psychiatric Association president and a good friend of all psychiatrists all over the world. Uh, Professor Abzal Javed uh, works in the United Kingdom and also a chair of uh, um, Pakistan Psychiatric Research Center in Lahore, Pakistan. Uh, Professor Afzal Javed works in the field of psychosocial rehabilitation in transcultural psychiatry and a great organizer in the field of uh, psychiatry. And uh, we are very honored to uh, listen to greetings words uh, from Professor Afzal Javed. Okay, thank you very much, Daria. Uh, Professor Kostos, uh, dear friends, it is in fact a great pleasure to say good morning, good afternoon and good evening to so many participants that Professor Kostos and his team has been able to organize. I'm personally grateful on my personal behalf as well as on behalf of World Psychiatric Association to the uh, Theosalenki University WPA section of evidence-based psychiatry, WPA section of pharmacopsychiatry, and the esteemed speakers who have agreed to be a part of this very insightful, exciting, and informative webinar. I must say that now, because of this COVID-19, we are learning new ways of communication. And you cannot believe before COVID-19 that just for one hour, we can have more than six, 700 people from 17, 18, 19 countries. I think whereas we are having the problems of the COVID, there are also some new ways of learning. And WPA is particularly grateful to Professor Kostos for his guidance, for his interest, and especially taking this important topic of psychopharmacology, which of course is a bread and butter of psychiatry. And the way he chooses the speakers and the way the speakers present their findings are highly relevant to our clinical practice. And I think that is the way forward that psychiatry, psychiatric education and psychiatric training, and more importantly, teaching and training in mental health should be directed. So once again, 
World Psychiatric Association is thankful to the organizers. And I look forward listening to very important speakers. And please do excuse me. I have not listened to some of the speakers, but what a great player that I will be listening to these speakers, especially the work which they are doing in the American region. Thank you very much, Daria. Thank you very much, dearest Professor Afzal Javed, for your greetings and for your great support on behalf of World Psychiatric Association. I would like to ask Professor Peter Morozov, who is elected as World Psychiatric Association Secretary General, uh, to say his greeting words. Professor Peter Morozov is a um, um, very famous professor in Russia and worldwide. And um, his fields of interest is uh, our history of psychiatry and epigenetics and uh, uh, organization in the field of psychiatry. And Professor Peter Morozov is also editor-in-chief in a very famous uh, uh, psychiatric journal in Russia titled um, uh, Psychiatry and Psychopharmacology. So, uh, Professor Peter Morozov, you are uh, welcome. 584 participants, 66 countries, 4 continents. Those are figures of our previous webinar. And uh, today we have more than 700. I think it's a great achievement. And if you are taking into the account uh, the regularity of this webinar, I would like to underline that we are going to have now the fifth webinar, consecutive webinar organized by Professor Costa Ontulakis. We are very grateful for your initiative. I think it's a, it's I think it's a success, and I can tell you even more that we have uh, some plans, WPA in collaboration with the um, University of Saloniki, to continue this webinar till at least uh, end of June, uh, at least uh, next June. Uh, and um, I think this is also results of uh, important and fruitful collaboration of uh, different uh, researchers around the world who would like to share their knowledge with the uh, psychiatrists around the world. Um, let's let's take as an example today webinar. We have a you know zonal representative from Southern Europe uh, and the participant from from South America. We have zonal representative from US and participants from Europe and, and from different other countries. This is really uh, great coverage. And um, I would like to remind also that this is also part of the WPA action plan for this triennium. And I think that uh, in front of us, there are a lot of uh, new uh, discovery and uh, educational training in the virtual level. And probably in the end of next year, hope we will see each other in Cartagena. Thank you. Thank you very much, dear Professor Peter Morozov, for a greeting, uh, for a greetings and for your support. And now we are moving to the program of the webinar. As all participants know, you have this option for question and answers down so you can write the questions to the speaker and the first speaker will be um, a respectful professor Konstantinos Fontolakis who is uh, um, WPA representative of uh, uh, South Southern Europe zone who is the chair of uh, two important sections in WPA WPA section on evidence-based psychiatry and section on pharmaca psychiatry uh, uh, in uh, this organization. Professor Konstantinos Fontolakis um, has numerous awards. He is editor-in-chief of uh, and also of General Psychiatry, very famous journal, and also uh, in the editorial board of uh, CNS Spectrum Journal, and also head of Cochrane Greece, and ECMP president and many, many other affiliations and many, many other achievements. And we are really lucky and we are really grateful to hear from 
Professor Konstantinos Fontoulakis. So, thank you, Prof. Costas. Thank you, Daria. Good afternoon, everybody, or good morning, depending on the continent you are. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, the treatment of refractory schizophrenia. Uh, not schizophrenia per se, but only for refractory cases. And this is a very uh, diff difficult and very um, under uh, discussed uh, issue because you know uh, schizophrenia is what we say what we call um, uh, a monotonous uh, disorder. It it uh, it goes on with uh, episodes, of course, but the deterioration is uh, steadily accumulating. It's not like bipolar disorder, which, ha which has different facets and you need different treatment across different phases and then uh, you need to uh, predict the future. Here is uh, rather simpler, but uh, in, 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 as a matter of fact, they are worse because the accumulated uh, disability is far, far worse. Uh, and also the, the treatment is simpler and when you fail with initial treatment, sometimes you are, you run out of choices and uh, the question is what what really the the evidence based uh, the literature uh, what what treatment options does it support uh, this is my conflict of interest for the last year i don't really have a conflict of interest since i am now a uh, director of coherent greece uh, which uh, prohibits any interaction with uh, part, uh, with potential conflicts of interest so I will try to be as uh, a, 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 a specific and as biased free I could possibly be. Uh, this is a picture, this is an image I love to show from time to time because it, it uh, reflects reality and it's a peculiar reality. This is uh, an 80 years old person that came into my private practice and he uh, he was asking for uh, uh, radical changes in his treatment plan. And uh, I, I asked him, how, what are you uh, receiving? And he then unfolded this paper. These are three A4 papers uh, sticked together. And as he said, you can see the, how organized he was, uh, rather his son was a very organized guy. And he even cut pieces from the, uh, uh, from the boxes of uh, medication and uh, glue it on the paper so that uh, the old guy would be able to see uh, what, uh, uh, which uh, medication would fit uh, in the morning or in the evening, blah, blah. And what you can see is that there are 22 medications, three antiparkinsonians, five antihypertensives, of course, three psychotropics, no, no real... Um, uh, no real uh, mentality be, uh, behind these uh, combinations. So what we need to have in mind is that often uh, our patients are treated with polypharm polypharmacy, that is with combinations, with various combinations of treatment agents. And we don't really have uh, a rationale be behind this. Uh, sometimes uh, patients go doctor shopping, as we say, that is, they go from doctor to doctor and they, uh, and each doctor feels obliged to add something or to change and add something. And then they end up like this 80 years old guy. So the first thing we need to have in mind is what, what is what, when we say that we have refractory treatment resistant schizophrenia, what do we mean? Well, this is a, a rather complex, uh, definition, at least we need to have in mind what is refractoriness during the acute phase. So first of all, we need to define response, which is a cl clinically uh, significant reduction, usually 50% in terms of a specific scale. Remission is absence or uh, presence of uh, uh, very, very low subthreshold symptoms. For example, to have, uh, uh, to have uh, uh, an impression uh, for remission, you need to have below eight in the Hamilton scale for depression. So something similar here, you need to have almost no uh, positive symptoms and very, very few negative. Relapse 
is when you have a very quick during maintenance period, you have a very quick return of symptoms. Well, recurrence is that when you have returning of symptoms in a full episode after several years, maybe, when the, uh, the first uh, acute episode has been in complete remission for a while. So uh, if the patient does not respond in the acute phase, during the acute phase, then you have a treatment resistant depression. If he is not achieving full remission, well, that's a partial response or partial uh, refractoriness. And also if he tends to relapse or uh, the, the, the disease tends to recur, then again, we have some kind of partial uh, resistance. Uh, but each of these uh, each of these problems needs somewhat a different um, uh, treatment consideration. So, uh, are all symptoms domain uh, respond to the same degree? Uh, by definition, schizophrenia is a refractory psychotic psychosis with uh, uh, a deteriorating long-term outcome, which means that by definition, schizophrenia is refractory. Uh, maybe positive symptoms have a, a better prognosis, negative symptoms have a, a less uh, favorable prognosis. We don't know what happens with uh, or how to treat the neurocognitive deficit or soft neurological signs. Uh, we don't know how to treat uh, the ongoing uh, uh, and the uh, deteriorating uh, impairment and disability. So in almost, in almost every patient with schizophrenia or in the vast majority, we will have some kind of, some type of residual symptoms we need to try to treat. Uh, what we also need to uh, point out here is that although the onset to, to treatment response is variable, uh, generally, those who respond early within the first week tend to respond very well uh, also very soon. Uh, if uh, the patient shows, shows no sign of uh, response during the first uh, one or two weeks, then the prognosis is bad. Uh, but what the KT showed, the KT study showed, is that we do have improvement, although it is slower in rate, improvement for at least the first one and a half year. And this improvement is slow and continuous. So we don't need to be so uh, pessimistic concerning the uh, outcome. We need to be patient, but still we need to act also uh, very rapidly when we see that the patient does not respond during uh, the first couple of weeks. Uh, and the other thing we need to take into consideration is whether polypharmacy, which is the rule when you have a refractory case, polypharmacy is also not only efficacious, but safe. And uh, when we, uh, safety is rather easy to determine because we know the side effects, we know the fragility of some patients. The question is how efficacious is this polypharmacy? And if efficacy can be determined into, uh, by taking into consideration two major things. The first is the evidence-based approach, uh, which is uh, uh, based on uh, data from uh, randomized controlled trials. And the second approach is uh, a rational approach, make, which may, you make sense uh, out of the uh, receptor profile and uh, the theory you have behind all these uh, uh, knowledge we have concerning uh, uh, the etiopathogenesis of schizophrenia. Uh, we don't know if we don't know if we have increased mortality after uh, antipsychotic polypharmacy. Sometimes we uh, we have data uh, in favor of this uh, uh, increased mortality, but uh, the uh, the general uh, picture is um, uh, is not conclusive. Uh, so if we go on with the evidence-based approach, we can see that we have uh, a, a constellation of positive and negative results. Uh, to add uh, a compound on another, to add risperidone on clozapine, uh, piracetam on any atypical antipsychotic or uh, uh, divalprox on haloperidone. Uh, 
there are some positive results with this combination. And also there are some other negative results, especially concerning lamotrigine uh, with, uh, with antidepressants. Uh, we have some positive and some negative results. Probably it depends on the specific uh, antidepressant and we don't have a class effect here. Uh, impressively, lithium, which is considered for, by many clinicians to be um, a treatment option for uh, refractory schizophrenia, treat, uh, lithium has rather negative uh, results and uh, also in combination with uh, antipsychotics and uh, clozapine. Uh, this, uh, what I said is for the general picture, clinical picture of schizophrenia, when it comes to positive symptoms, we can see that combination of clozapine uh, with uh, some, some uh, uh, second generation and psychotic could have some positive results, although sometimes the results are equivocal. And interestingly, topiramate and lamotrigine could have some uh, effect. Uh, the, the results are uh, balanced, but meta-analysis suggested that topiramate has uh, uh, an overall uh, positive uh, effect. And this is also the, uh, the case with lamotrigine. For memantine and the donepezil, the results are rather negative, and also for buspiron and mirtazapine. Uh, what I want to uh, make here uh, a note is that topiramate is uh, a GABA A agonist. And uh, a, a novel uh, theory for schizophrenia is that we have uh, some kind of uh, abrupt uh, activity in the hippocampus, uh, which drives the dopaminergic hyperactivity. There is not a, a there's not a primary uh, dopaminergic hyperactivity in schizophrenia. It is driven by hyperactivity in the hippocampus. And the only way to reduce this hyperactivity is to use a GABA-A agonist. And topiramate is such an A, GABA-A agonist. But if you use benzodiazepines, which are a mixed GABA-A or GABA-B uh, agonist, you don't get the same result. Uh, also, if you use other GABA agonists, you don't have the results that you get with this specific uh, GABA agonists. Uh, for, uh, the, uh, for the negative symptoms, things are uh, a little bit more uh, confused, uh, confusing. Maybe antidepressants, with antidepressants, we could have some positive uh, results. But again, you can see how fuzzy is the, uh, the literature. Uh, general psychopathology probably again uh, responds to topiramate and antidepressants, but here we have a very, very, very few data. Um, the biggest problem maybe in schizophrenia is cognitive decline, which is also which accumulates also uh, with age, suggesting that there is also a vascular component, let's say after the age of 60, 65. And today we have patients that live and uh, uh, thankfully they, 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 they have uh, a longer uh, survival and uh, they reach their 70s and or even 80s. So these people uh, taking into consideration also their lifestyle, they tend to uh, have uh, higher rates of cardiovascular episodes and uh, uh, vasculopathy. So we need to treat them probably with uh, anti-dementia drugs, but still we have only rather negative results. So the, the literature here is not encouraging. Probably primary prevention, which is very difficult. How can you, how can you persuade these people to follow a healthy lifestyle with uh, uh, weight reduction exercise? We, we can't ourselves, how can they? Uh, it's very difficult. Still primary, um, prior prevention could be the uh, a main factor uh, for the cognitive for the prevention of cognitive decline in patients with schizophrenia. Now, uh, meta-analysis suggests that adding uh, lamotrigine, uh, anticholinesterase inhibitors, or antidepressant on uh, uh, an atypical antipsychotic could be of value, but still not not that. Uh, that's straightforward. So if we summarize this data, we can say that there are some evidence that suggests an increased mortality with polypharmacy. 
uh, there is a limited number of indications for a limited number of agents concerning combination therapy. You can use only a few combination options to treat very specific things. Um, the scientific basis of these combinations is very thin. And uh, what is interesting is that this combination uh, rational uh, is driven uh, with the so-called syndromic rather than nosologically oriented um, uh, conceptualization of the disease. For example, he, uh, the patient with schizophrenia has depression, you give him an antidepressant, has a positive symptomatology, you increase or uh, optimize the dosage of an antipsychotic or you change antipsychotics. It's not specific for a diagnostic entity as schizophrenia. So it's not, uh, it's an antipsychotic, a general antipsychotic treatment and uh, um, uh, case management rather than a specific anti-schizophrenia treatment and case management. Uh, could we use something more advanced like uh, neurobiologically rational uh, that we know that uh, we have this uh, receptor A that uh, uh, plays with receptor B2, 3 and uh, they interact with uh, this super receptor uh, uh, XYZ. Well, um, we have some kind of uh, rational uh, approaches here, like the combination of high and low potency antipsychotics or of different classes of antipsychotics and different classes of agents like antipsychotic plus uh, antiepileptic or plus antidepressive. Um, some people say you can take advantage of side effects like uh, sedation or you can create, that's the most refined way, uh, a cocktail uh, to target specific receptors. Now, how, how rational are really all these? First, no data. Second, uh, no positive data. Second, uh, all the data we have are not only negative, but they are disappointing. The only thing we know about schizophrenia for, for sure, and for antipsychotic drugs for sure, is that they are anti-dopaminergic and that schizophrenia responds to anti-dopaminergic agents. We don't know the pathophysiology of schizophrenia uh, deep enough so that in our everyday clinical practice, we, we uh, design our strategy in terms of combinations of uh, receptor targets. Um, so when you run out of antidopaminergic options, then uh, it, it's rather very difficult to say that, okay, we have another pathway towards uh, treatment uh, efficacy. Now, if you think that you can take advantage of side effects, this is an illusion. If uh, the uh, uh, if the drug induces sedation, then what happens when the patient uh, remits? You change the drug, you don't know if the specific new agent will have the same beneficial effect. So you risk uh, to uh, let your uh, patient uh, uh, and not covered by medication. For example, let's suppose you use haloperidol in the acute phase and then you say, okay, I don't want to have a patient under haloperidol for prolonged periods of time. So I change into olanzapine. You don't know if olanzapine is suitable for this patient. He starts receiving the new drug when his symptoms free. So you don't really know. So all these uh, very, very sophisticated and very clever, let's say, uh, theoretical approaches are not essentially pragmatic and not supported by the data, but still they are followed to a large extent. So if we want to have a conclusion, polypharmacy versus monotherapy, the safety problem is not much. Uh, you have some increased mortality, it's uncertain. You have some problems with uh, vulnerable populations, but we know that so we can, uh, we can manage. Uh, the problem is that efficacy is not uh, supported by the data, is not supported by real experience, and most of the uh, evidence is negative. Uh, so uh, what we have here is um, a riddle, a clinical uh, riddle that we need to tackle in our, in our uh, everyday clinical practice. And it's, it works like an illusion. You see things where they don't exist, and you think you have the solution where 
when you don't have it. And experience for some very bitter people, including myself, is the ability to repeat the same mistakes over time again and again with increasing confidence. So, <laughs> okay, maybe the, this is not the absolute truth, but still it's, it's true for, uh, to a large extent. Uh, the most advanced uh, algorithm to date for the treatment of uh, refractory schizophrenia is the CIMP treatment guidelines for schizophrenia. They have not been published, but they, you can find them in the CIMP web page. And uh, what they recommend is that you uh, wait for two to four weeks uh, before you say that your patient is refractory, although they recognize that patients who uh, respond early, they have the highest rate of response. So response should, you expect the response to, 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 uh, to show uh, during the first one or two weeks, but you wait, you give some one or two weeks more. So by the third or fourth week, you need to change the, uh, the treatment. Uh, you optimize uh, dosage. Uh, some uh, some agents uh, uh, require slow titration, like clozapine requires so slow titration. So some people uh, use clozapine in low dosages, and this is a problem. You need to go uh, to the uh, upper recommended uh, dosages to say that the, the person is responsive or not. And um, um, at any way, uh, you need to, to have some kind of uh, uh, insight and uh, close monitoring of patients before you say that you need to change the treatment. Now, if there is an initial non-response during the acute phase, then you can switch the antipsychotic, although the data are not really um, that good the dose should be increased, as we say. Um, uh, the way you, you will change is overlap and tupper. This is the cross over uh, and uh, uh, you reduce the dosage while you increase the, the other one. Uh, you, uh, you need to pay attention to side effects because uh, if you have used sedation, in a patient as a tool, then you, you switch to an agent without sedative effects. So you might have some problems there, but still uh, the problem is rather the efficacy, not the side effects. Clozapine is the, uh, the, is, is the agent of choice for the treatment of resistant patients. Uh, the data was good when the uh, CIMP uh, developed its guidelines. Um, I will show you that this is not the case anymore. Uh, some combinations might have some efficacy, but uh, we don't really know. Uh, we have some uh, data concerning uh, a better side effect profile with uh, specific combinations, especially with aripiprazole. My personal opinion is that aripiprazole knocks it kicks out the other agents from receptors. So uh, when you give haripiprazole plus haloperidol is as if you are giving the patient uh, aripiprazole monotherapy because the KI is very strong with uh, aripiprazole. I wouldn't recommend that, uh, but still you need to mention uh, all these details. Um, you can use uh, combinations of antipsychotics with topiramate or lamotrizine. Uh, and other antipsychotics, and of course, consider uh, ECT. Uh, these two agents, lamotrigine and topiramate, especially topiramate, are very promising as add on compounds before you resort to ECT. Uh, if you have pre uh, predominantly negative symptoms, the best way, the best thing you can do is to add an antidepressant or low dose of amisulpride. My personal opinion is an antidepressant. And for chronic uh, aggressive behavior, the best way you can treat is a low potency antipsychotic at high dosages like clozapine, like uh, perfenazine. Uh, for suicidality, maybe clozapine is the uh, first choice. And this is why uh, clozapine might not be uh, uh, consider any more the best choice for treatment refractory cases because in head-to-head uh, -head comparisons, it, it, it shows no superiority 
over olanzapine, uh, risperidone and uh, ziprasidone. The superiority of clozapine uh, it comes mainly from uh, from trials uh, of the late 80s and early 90s, uh, but uh, if you look uh, closer at the data, uh, its uh, efficacy in refractory cases against other antipsychotics is not uh, supported. What you need to have in mind is that sometimes you have patients whose brain barrier, uh, blade brain barrier, uh, does not permit antipsychotics to cross into the brain. Uh, but this is not the case with clozapine. In this particular patient, clozapine crosses the blood-brain barrier, so it could be beneficial where other antipsychotics are not. You can see here how chaotic uh, the, uh, the experience of uh, patients are, and our aim is to try to free them from their uh, uh, bonds. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Professor, for your uh, uh, presentation. We have some questions for you. So we have um, the questions and answers box for the, um, the panelists to answer. We have a question here about the antidepressant effect for negative symptoms, doctor. And, what about your experience with um, mirtazapine and fluoxetine uh, for uh, negative symptoms or schizophrenia? Oh, you are on, you are mute. <laughs> okay. For the first questions, uh, for the first question concerning different uh, agents like uh, sertraline or uh, fluoxetine, um, the data are uh, confusing, and the meta-analysis pulls data from all antidepressants together. So it, the meta-analysis arrives at uh, uh, at the conclusion that as 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 a class, antidepressants are efficacious, but we cannot really say whether a specific one uh, is efficacious and others not. And there is no real, uh, there's no real uh, reason why they shouldn't be because uh, probably all of the depressants work the same way uh, through uh, serotonin and norepinephric uh, pathways. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I would say that you can use any of them and see, we don't have data to answer such a specific question anyway. Now, long acting and clozapine. Um, now, long acting antipsychotics is, 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 is a chapter by itself, a difficult chapter by itself. Patients don't like them. Let's be honest, patients don't like them. We like them because they are uh, easy to use and uh, maybe families like them. Uh, the problem with uh, long-acting antipsychotics is that they are very low, a very low dosage. Uh, you might have a patient uh, who responds to 20 or 30 milligrams of uh, haloperidol and how much, how much uh, long-acting haloperidol you can give him or and these refractory patients do not respond to low dosages of antipsychotics. Uh, with clozapine, the problem is that if you have uh, uh, if you have some uh, adverse event like uh, 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 low low uh, white cells, um, you might need also to uh, uh, to, to discontinue for uh, for a period of several days or weeks the other antipsychotics. So I would be that in fond of uh, using uh, a long-term uh, injectable with uh, clozapine, but you can, of course. Uh, there is no prohibition of that. Uh, for topiramate, the only thing we know is that topiramate could induce suicidality. Uh, uh, also, a second uh, anti-epileptic anti leviracetam could induce uh, suicidality, not psychosis, to my knowledge. Uh, uh, in, in, in patients with schizophrenia, you don't see that. You don't see this increase in suicidality. Uh, but you can see it in patients with uh, epilepsy 
And you also see this in patients with personality disorders and uh, depression and in normal volunteers, but not in patients with schizophrenia. At least I don't have data to uh, say that. So you can use it with re relatively um, safety. Still, any combination needs uh, monitoring. Of course. Professor, we have another question here about negative symptoms. What about new generation antipsychotics like cariprasine? Well, when you see at the initial trials, all antipsychotics had an effect on the negative symptoms. This was not verified later. So we need to, to be some, somewhat patient and to see how patients, patient, and see how the uh, data gathering goes. Mm -hmm. Okay. And the last question here from Marina Losevich. Uh, when treating a patient with a story where a history of severe offense on community treatment orders, etc., what should we have to take into consideration first? Safety for the patient? or safety for society? Well, this is not a question for me. It's a question <laughs> for everybody and especially for uh, Afzal Zaved. I think we, we need to, <laughs> ask, to ask this this question and leave it for another uh, for another <laughs> webinar. We, we, we promise a webinar on uh, forensic and socio-cultural things. Okay, Professor, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much to Professor Konstantinos Pontolakis for this amazing lecture. And I would like to tell you that uh, Professor Maria Teresa Riviera and Chinas from uh, Peru assisted us with question and answers session. Thank you very much, Maria Teresa. It was very helpful. And now we are moving to another presentation. Again, you can uh, ask your questions in this box, uh, uh, question and answers, and Matea will help us. And uh, the next speaker is um, Professor Marc de Hert from Leuven, Belgium. Uh, Marc uh, is a university um, professor, professor of the University Psychiatric uh, Center in Leuven, Belgium. Um, he works in the Department of Neurosciences in um, Catholic University of Leuven and also Professor Mark De Hert is the chair of Antwerpen Health Law and Ethics and um, um, achieved his uh, uh, medical degree and PhD in Antwerpen University. And today the topic of the talk of Professor Mark De Hert will be physical health issue in people with severe mental, mental illness. It's very important topic and we are welcome Professor Mark to share his screen to the floor. It's our honor. So good evening to you all and uh, thanks the organizers uh, for inviting me to present. So um, so yeah, uh, conflict of interest, I have none to mention. I work mainly uh, as a clinical psychiatrist with people with long-term uh, psychosis. And I'm not a chair of the Antwerp Health Law and Ethics School. I'm just a PhD student there. So later in life, I decided to go back to school and study law in order to get a, a PhD in health law. But that's uh, another uh, story. So uh, the topic of physical illness in severe mental disorder, um, it has been uh, a point of attention uh, of the WPA and we, uh, we published a, a first and large meta-analysis on the subjects already some years ago. And as you can see from the slide, actually any physical illness you can look at appears to be more frequently in people with severe mental illness. For the remainder of the talk, we'll mainly focus on cardiometabolic disorders because they have a high impact on uh, patient mortality. But as uh, yeah, COVID entered the world, 
and uh, I'll end with uh, the question on whether there are links between uh, the risk for COVID and the, the risk for COVID uh, mortality in people with severe mental illness. And it be will become clear that one of the reasons why COVID could kill people with severe mental illness more frequently than the average citizens, it's in part or mainly because of cardiometabolic risk. So I could have presented a lot of slides on the increased mortality with people with severe mental illness. I just uh, picked out one slide uh, of a study in, in Denmark where you see if you compare people with, in the general population, either male or female, with people with schizophrenia, the mortality gap, as it is called, appears to be getting wider year by year. So a number of things could be happening. A, one thing which is certain is that people in the general population are getting more healthy or getting uh, better health care and because of that live longer. But apparently at the same time, or for some kind of reason, this doesn't seem to be happening in people with schizophrenia. They either accumulate a lot of uh, cardiometabolic risk and die earlier. And on average, the loss of life is between 20 and 30 years of loss of life, which is enormous. And why could this be? Then uh, we could take a, uh, a shortcut to yeah, what you should remember from medical school, looking at the classical risk factors for cardiovascular disease. Because if you look at uh, premature mortality in people with SMI, it appears to be that cardiovascular death is the main killer of uh, people with severe mental illness. So on the one hand, you have modifiable risk factors and at the other end, non-modifiable ones. But if you look at the, the list of modifiable uh, risk factors, they all appear to be more prevalent in people with severe mental illness. And as you might remember from medical school, the famous Framingham study, it's not only important to know whether you have one risk factors, but it's also important for your patients to know whether they have one, two, three or more risk factors. And the risk is not only additive, it goes up exponentially. So this is a bad story if you have a patient with uh, a number of risk factors. If you turn it around, if you have a patient with a risk factor and you're able to eliminate one, the gain on health will be important. This is a very complex slide on everything we know on cardiometabolic risk, but if you just look at the yellow circles, people with severe mental illness tend to be overweight, they tend to be uh, not very physically active, eating habits are not perfect, they smoke, and if they smoke, they smoke a lot, and substance abuse is a problem in a, a, a large proportion of patients. Turning this to what's the evidence, what does uh, the literature tell you and whether you look at schizophrenia or bipolar disorder, the odds or the rates of obesity, smoking, diabetes, hypertension, dyslipidemia or a sort of clustered risk factor, the, the so-called metabolic syndrome is highly much more prevalent in people with severe mental illness. So it's um, reasonable to assume if you have a lot of risk factors, the endpoint of the risk factors, which could be either diabetes or cardiovascular disease, will be more prevalent. And why might this be? Or the question could be, uh, do we attribute uh, to the risk? And then the question is the treatments we give, are they actually capable of increasing those cardiometabolic risk factors. This is once again an older uh, study. This is a more recent study in world psychiatry 
And it's not only the case for antipsychotics, but for also for some of the antidepressants and some of the mood stabilizers, they can actually increase cardiometabolic risk factors and increase the risk of severe somatic diseases. And then you can sort of develop, uh, yeah, sort of uh, lists of agents with a lot of risks, which agents which appear to be more neutral and uh, a number of agents which might be more low or neutral on risk. So as clinicians, I think we have a choice and we are the ones mainly in collaboration with the patients, of course, uh, we will decide which kind of treatment we will install Though, though we should, thus we should be aware of the risk we might induce. Uh, just sort of, yeah, the, the previous studies were a little older. This is just out in uh, Frontiers Endocrinology. We did a, an update of all the literature on uh, increased risk for, and this uh, specifically obesity and uh, once again, metabolic uh, syndrome as a composite uh, risk factor and sort of the list of drugs which induce the problem or make it worse hasn't changed over recent years. So you'll find both antipsychotics, antidepressants and mood stabilizers which can uh, induce more or less risk. Um, a systematic review and meta-analysis on sedentary behavior and physical activity in people with severe mental illness. Once again, yeah, proving or showing that physical activity is not perfect in our patients. And uh, in the end of my talk, I'll present uh, a recent guideline. Uh, if you're looking at clinical care, it is important to help people to become more active and it can be uh, efficient. So there is room for improvement. So, and I'll summarize my 20 years of literature in, in five slides. Uh, so what do we know of uh, diabetes in people with severe mental illness rates are higher than in the normal population for people in the, the population with the, the same age. On average, diabetes comes uh, 10 years younger for people of the same age with uh, uh, a BMI much uh, lower than people with diabetes in the general population. And the risks are a little bit different uh, per specific diagnosis, but on average, you could say it's two to three times higher, both in schizophrenia, bipolar, schizoaffective, but also in major depression. The story is quite similar for cardiovascular disease. Uh, the risk is significantly increased uh, in schizophrenia, bipolar, three to five times higher, depression also five times higher. So once again, an important link, which well, interestingly for depression might be di bi-directional, but that's uh, another topic. Within cardiovascular disease, it's both coronary heart disease, which is increased as well as cerebrovascular disease. So in, well, you could say any uh, cardiometabolic endpoint you look at, the risk uh, for both illness and death is more pronounced in people with severe mental illness. Sudden cardiac death is yeah, obviously not really cardiometabolic. Uh, the question there is, uh, do the drugs we use have the potency to uh, impact QTC intervals and, and enlarge that interval and lead to uh, arrhythmias? Uh, apparently, the risk is a little bit higher, but not impressively higher. Um, 
and the best studies uh, on this topic are by Ray et al. And what appears to come out of the studies, it's not the individual uh, antipsychotic, which, is, which as such is important, but it's mainly related to dose. So once you start up using higher dose, the, the, the risk increases. And apparently not only dose, but combinations can increase the risks and not alone uh, combinations with uh, between antipsychotics, but also specifically the combination between antipsychotics and tricyclic antidepressants is important as a risk factor. So yeah, it's only a brief talk, but yeah, I, I hope I was able to convince you that yeah, physical illness is an important issue in our patients. And if it's an important issue, the question is, why isn't it dealt with in a proper way? And this was another uh, WPA Commission paper in which we looked at all the possible barriers which might impact the, the possibilities of our patients to get adequate physical health care. So, yeah, the first problem might lie with us, with psychiatrists. Uh, we could, well, and there was certainly an era when we weren't aware of the cardiometabolic risk uh, in people with severe uh, mental illness. There was a time that we were actually not very aware that our drugs could actually increase the risk. And yeah, as psychiatrists, we sort of uh, targeted on mental health, the brain, the mind, we, we sort of tended to forget that people also have a body which uh, needs taking care of. And yeah, we sort of have yeah, forgotten that we are also medical doctors and that we should have some basic medical skills as well. Obviously, it's not only the psychiatrist, it's also the patients who uh, pose specific problems. They might have cognitive uh, disorders. They might have difficulties in well communicating whether they feel something in their body, whether it's related to their anxieties or mental problems. So communication could be problematic. Um, they could actually delay uh, in asking for physical help. But I think there is a problem in patients, but the problem in doctors is much larger. Um, we tend to look at uh, the GPs or the, the family doctors in order to take care of those problems. But yeah, right. I don't know whether, because right, we, we have an audience from all over the world, I can only talk about Belgium, but most uh, family doctors are not very keen and and skillful in dealing with uh, mental health patients. We know from studies in Belgium, uh, people with chronic uh, schizophrenia, only one out of three has a family doctor or a GP. So two thirds of the patients, the only doctor they will see will actually be a psychiatrist, which is uh, maybe not very reassuring. Uh, if there's proper health care in the first line, and if, uh, for instance, blood work is being done. Quite often there is a problem of communication. Uh, results are not shared or it's not clear who will look at the data, who will make uh, clinical decisions about an uh, elevated glucose or an elevated lipid panel, panel. So there is some work which needs to be done there. And then you could say there's problem uh, on the level of the, the global health system. We know that there's uh, time constraints uh, for everybody. Finances is always and everywhere a problem, but yeah, there are countries where it's not even possible to have basic lab work done, but in most places it is possible and there are easy and cheap tools to look after patients. A scale isn't expensive. Uh, a tape ruler to measure waist circumference is not a big investment. Um, measuring uh, blood pressure is possible everywhere. So uh, the health system can be a problem, can be a barrier, 
but uh, some of the things can be resolved. And what can we do? And then again, we could look at the literature, but there's a vast area of good clinical guidelines around. Uh, these are the, the guidelines from the European psychiatrists. They have been around since 2009, which is a long time. Uh, but if you look at studies, whether uh, these guidelines really get implemented in daily uh, clinical care, then the results are yeah, sobering. Uh, the best studies show that maybe 20% of patients are screened and monitored in an adequate way, which is really uh, and remains uh, problematic. Uh, smoking, as I mentioned, is a problem. There is a guideline on how you should assess and tackle uh, smoking in people with severe mental illness. And the evidence once again show that it's worthwhile trying. It's not easy, but it's not easy for any smoker to stop. And maybe it's a little bit more difficult for our patients, but in any case, it should be and remain worthwhile trying. The same is true for physical activity and sedentary lifestyle. There is a guideline, a good guideline around, which shows you what could be done and how it should be done. And once again, the challenge will be, uh, as, as is with all guidelines, how and how much time it will take before a guideline, which can be effective if it's really implemented in daily clinical care. And then sort of the, yeah, the, the circle is round. Uh, COVID has entered the scene. And um, what well, we just counted uh, yesterday, because uh, we're doing a, um, a systematic review, which we call COVID madness. Because uh, if you just look at PubMed, the amount of papers which are being published published on uh, COVID and, and mental health is impressive. But the number of good studies is still uh, very small. But these are examples of good studies which came out within, I would say, the last six weeks showing indeed once again that people with severe, severe mental illness are more at risk to uh, catch COVID and they're actually more at risk to develop a severe illness and they're more at risk uh, for premature, uh, premature mortality. So once again, a reason why psychiatrists should be looking and, and looking at the safety of our patients and the, the, the reason why they might be dying more of COVID than other populations is actually related to, in part, the psychiatric illness and, and, and treatment uh, facilities. But it's mainly because they already carry the risk factors for mortality, which are coming out in the general population as well. Two more studies uh, which uh, recently came out. And just uh, recently, we published uh, an opinion, uh, and we're doing the, the full literature search on that. But there is, I think, a very good argument for psychiatrists in the different countries to lobby with your local authorities if they're all making lists on who should be prioritized for uh, vaccination for COVID. Uh, and of course, we think first of healthcare workers, of course, we think of uh, vulnerably older people, but we believe that people with uh, severe mental illness should be high on the priority list as well. But we'll see what will happen in uh, yeah, the, the months to come. So this is my before last slides. Um, and just look at the dates. Uh, 2008. With, this is an old paper in the Journal of Clinical Psychiatry, but it's still, I think, uh, yeah, very, um, yeah, up to date and, uh, and and still saying what we need to do. Uh, we are psychiatrists, but we're also medical doctors. We are the ones who install treatment. 
So at least we should take responsibility for our patients, not only for their mental health, but also for their physical health. It doesn't mean that, that we have to do everything ourselves, but we need to assure that the things which needs to be done are being done by someone and that the care which is being offered maybe by different uh, healthcare workers is at least coordinated. Uh, I think we have a task to yeah, educate our fellow physicians, uh, GPs and doctors in cardiology, endocrinology, because uh, these specialists are may maybe even more afraid uh, of our patients than GPs. Um, and actually the mission should be that physical health is at par for everybody in the community, whether you have a severe mental illness or you don't have one. And we need, we will need to work together with other specialties. So that's sort of the mission which we had in 2008, but I think which uh, still remains uh, yeah, uh, prominently uh, necessary today. So this is my last slide. Uh, so we're thinking of, if you were thinking of Christmas and you want something for under the Christmas tree, there is a new uh, edition of medicine in psychiatry out. There is in preparation uh, a new book on physical illness in uh, uh, mental illness from, the, uh, from uh, the APA, which is about to be published or it should have been published this year but it, it maybe will uh, reach us before the end of the year. Um, physical activity is a very cheap intervention and can be offered everywhere. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, for Professor Mark. Your presentation was really nutritive for all of us. And, and I, I'm keeping your message that we must not forget that we are physicians and we have to help patients with an integral uh, management. Now we have some questions from the audience and I'm going to ask. Um, there's here from Dimitra, and is COVID-19 related with deaths of people with mental illness because of the mental situation or because of other serious health diseases that may be, uh, be behind the mental disorder? And she means uh, we are still investigating the COVID-19. Thank you. Um. Well, yeah, obviously it's a, a moving field, so it's it's hard to to be uh, certain about a number of things. But yeah, in any case, people with severe mental illness, I think, are a vulnerable population. They're at high risk of social disadvantage. They're of often course. poor. Uh, their living conditions are are not perfect. Uh, if they reside in facilities, facilities that are often crowded. If you look at the beginning of the COVID uh, epidemic, uh, I think PPE in psychiatric institutions was, well, it was a problem everywhere, but specifically in psychiatry. Uh, I think at this point in time, PPE are available yeah, for most people. And I think also for our, our patients, but severe mental illness, could be associated with more risky behavior, meaning that social distancing is maybe more difficult for them uh, than for people without mental illness. But I think those are yeah, potential contributing factors. But I think if you look at uh, COVID illness and COVID mortality, it's mainly the association with uh, cardiometabolic risk factors, which will increase their uh, risk of illness and mortality in combination with um, yeah, problems in accessing proper care. Uh, I think in a number of places, and I know for Belgium, we have had problems in getting uh, patients with severe mental illness in COVID wards 
because uh, the people in the somatic uh, department sort of were afraid of can we cope with both the COVID problem and the severe mental illness at the same time because we don't know how to deal with patients so there might also be a problem there yes of course thank you professor we have another question here um uh, from fabiano gomez um i will read this thank you professor for your presentation your work in this field has been really important do you think there should be a shift to treating patients with severe mental illness first with metabolical sa safer medication particularly in the earlier stages of illness and do you think we have enough that data to make that type of statement in guidelines, for example? Uh, I could give a short answer and that would be yes. I think uh, <laughs> we, we have a choice. Uh, when we, uh, certainly in, in first episode patients, we have a choice between an array of uh, agents. And then I think that the main driver of choice should, should be safety first. And there are options which, if you look at the evidence uh, and, and mainly the, the studies by the group of Stefan Lloyd, actually on uh, efficacy, there is not much difference in between any of the drugs. Mm -hmm. uh, not between the new drugs and the old drugs, no, not between the, the new drugs amongst themselves. So the main difference is not efficacy. The main difference between agents is side effects. And yeah, you have a choice. You can choose uh, a metabolically safe agent and see whether yeah, it works, which, whether the patient doesn't have other side effects because there's, there's no drug, drug which is efficacious, which doesn't have the risk of side effect. But if you're specifically looking at the cardiometabolic risk, we have a choice. And mm -hmm. uh, probably a drug like olanzapine, which is an easy drug to use, and but the, the, the risk of car cardiometabolic risk is that important. And probably if it were to become on the market now, it will would never pass the regulatory agencies. Mm -hmm. So it wouldn't be first line ever. Uh, but that's my opinion. Thank you, doctor. And from Solomon uh, Reitamen, uh, what do you offer to patients with SMI who smoke a lot? <laughs> oh, that's a problem. Um, so the who really smoke a lot, we, uh, and this is a, a very silly practical advice I learned from a, a, a doctor in per, pulmonary medicine. So if you have a, a patient who smokes three packs a day, okay, which is a lot, uh, uh, then I think it's really pointless to say or suggest, yeah, you should stop and we have maybe uh, some patches you can use and then the patient would need to, to stick on four or five patches, which is totally silly. Uh, but if you have a patient who really smokes a lot, uh, then I think you, you should agree with your patient that stopping uh, is useful, but will take a lot of time. And what I learned from uh, the doctor of pulmonary medicine is the, that you sort of uh, try to convince pa patients for a week to sort of count how much cigarettes they smoke a day and mm -hmm. keep the track for a week. And then try the next week, they say, well, uh, you came up with, uh, let's say 60 cigarettes a day as the average. Then the instruction should be from the, for the second week to smoke, and they have to smoke, um, let's say 58, and the week after 56, and sort of the tapering. It could be lower than two two cigarettes a week, but a very slow uh, tapering method in which patients learn to count and learn to think about: Do I need to smoke this cigarette now? So, and then if you sort of go down to one pack a day, then you maybe have a reasonable option 
to use patches or or whatever you as uh, as nicotine replacement thank you very much professor for your presentation for your answers uh, we are delighted with all of your uh, information thank you for for being here and now i leave you with uh, professor daria thank you uh, thank you dear Marte, for your assistance uh, uh, thank you very much dear professor uh, Mark De Hert for your amazing lecture. It's really very important uh, topic and especially uh, during the time of COVID pandemics. We could also discuss many things, especially regarding our psychotropic drugs, which can uh, really induce respiratory distress, for example, antipsychotics or benzodiazepines, or we can also, uh, how we can manage panic in COVID patients uh, and uh, avoid uh, our um, psychotropic drugs, which cause also not just cardiometabolic, but respiratory distress. So it will be also the task for this uh, direction in psychiatry about physical uh, health and uh, mental uh, state uh, comorbidity. Um, and now we move to the third speaker. Um, uh, the next uh, topic uh, will be first episode psychosis treatment in the Hispanic population. And we are uh, very honored to have uh, here Professor Mauricio Tohen, uh, who is uh, uh, university distinguished professor and chairman at the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences at the University of New Mexico. And uh, uh, Professor Mauricio Tohen has uh, incredible impact factor on publications, on research publications. And uh, he studied in uh, Toronto and in Harvard and uh, um, has a doctorate in epidemiology and public health. So uh, we are very honored to have Professor Mauricio Tehan together with us as a leading expert in the field of uh, um, major psychotic disorders. Thank you very much for being with us and we're looking forward to your talk. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Smirnova for such a kind introduction. And uh, we must uh, thank Professor Javed and Morozov for their leadership that is uh, putting us all together. It's amazing. Uh, I've been looking at the chat and we have people from Nigeria, from Bosnia and Herzegovina, from Greece, from India, from uh, Moldova. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor Smirnova. Um, well, we uh, first uh, re uh, heard from uh, Professor Futanopoulos about, uh, from Professor Costas, about uh, heart treatment resistant schizophrenia and the different uh, approaches. And then we heard from Dr. Uh, De Hart uh, about the co medical comorbidities that patients with schizo schizophrenia have. So uh, I'm going to be talking. Uh, it's, it's, it's pharmacology, but I'm not going to talk about uh, what are the better treatments or what are the treatments that cause the most side effects, but actually I'm going to be talking about getting those medications to pop uh, populations that need them. And uh, I'm going to focus on a, on a population of the U.S., the, the Hispanic population. It's actually a large uh, uh, percentage of the uh, American population. It's uh, now... Uh, 20% uh, at least. So it's a growing population. And um, the access to care in the U.S. Uh, differs. It is not like uh, Western uh, Europe or, or, uh, or Europe in general or Eastern Asia where everybody gets treatment. Um, in, in America, some folks get fabulous treatment and some don't. And that is related to socioeconomic status and to ethnicity. So I'm going to talk about uh, how to get treatment to those populations that need it, in this case, Hispanics. And uh, it is great that this is a global talk because our findings 
I think can apply to populations in every part of the world, not only in, in places where there's minority populations, but in places where the uh, um, health services are not as good as they are in the, in the Western world. So thank you again, Professor Smirnova, for having me here today. Let me now share my slides. So as Professor Smirnova mentioned, I'm from the University of New Mexico. Let me uh, clarify a couple of things about New Mexico. Number one, it's not in Mexico, and number two, it's not new. Uh, and let me tell you a little bit about the history of New Mexico. And again, this is an opportunity to get to know each other better. So uh, uh, first disclosures, um, I have been a consultant with a, with a number of pharmaceutical companies. And in fact, at some point I was an industry scientist. Um, so New Mexico. So as you can see, New Mexico is in the Southwest. Uh, we're neighbors with Texas and with, uh, with Arizona and with Mexico. Actually, my dear friend Bernardo NG, he's from right here, right on the border. So uh, the history of New Mexico, actually it's, uh, we do have a history. Uh, in fact, it was, uh, it was, New Mexico was the first part of North America uh, that was colonized by Europeans. It was not uh, in Plymouth Rock. It was actually, actually Florida, uh, by this, uh, also by the Spaniards and also New Mexico in the 1500s uh, when there was an expedition. And of course, many expeditions uh, start in order to get uh, uh, gold and things of that nature. So in the 1500s, and actually the, uh, the last conquistador uh, in fact, was born in Mexico, Oñate, and he uh, he was the founder of the uh, of the province province of uh, of, of New Mexico. Um, he actually, at the end, was expelled because he was he was a cruel conquistador. So, uh, uh, as uh, as mentioned, colonized uh, in the 1500s by Spain. In the mid 19th century, uh, it, it moved from being part of Mexico to being part of the U.S. Uh, it's been a U.S. state since uh, uh, 1912. It's actually the uh, the fifth largest, so it's it's a large state, but it's not uh, populated as densely as other states. Actually, is the sixth smallest. Our population is two million people. Uh, where I live in Albuquerque is just over uh, half a million. And uh, interestingly, uh, the, a, a good degree of the uh, percent of the population is Spanish speaker. Most people are bilingual, but not everybody. And this is another very interesting thing about New Mexico. 10% of the population of New Mexico is Native American and the rest of the US is less than 1%. So very unique in that way. So we have a number of uh, uh, Native American populations that I'm sure you heard, the Navajo, Navajo and the Apache. And uh, actually it has a, a high percentage of Hispanics, um, uh, almost 50%, uh, which is the highest of any state in terms of rate. Me, this is a nice uh, thing that I always like to share about New Mexico. So of course, uh, when the, uh, the Spaniards came to uh, uh, Mexico, they would go here to Veracruz. And then this is how New Mexico was colonized through the Camino Real de Tierra Adentro. The nice story is that of course, many of the early conquistadors, well, with the conquistadors, we have the priests. So they brought wine with them. Uh, and the, tr the time that it took from Mexico City to New Mexico was like six months. So of course, no more wine left. So that's why wine started in what is now the US not in California, it started in New Mexico and then went west. That's kind of an interesting story about New Mexico. So very colorful state, so uh, uh, please visit us whenever you can. Let's get to the presentation. So uh, as I mentioned, I'm gonna talk about uh, first episode psychosis, how to get uh, this population to receive treatment, specifically the Hispanic population. Uh, so we're going to uh, talk about some of our findings uh, uh, in the, uh, we have a coordinated specialty care clinic. Uh, this is a model that was initiated by Kane in New York and it has expanded literally all over the country. It has been very effective. And the way that I see it is almost like doing preventive medicine in psychiatry because it's getting treatment to patients with first episode psychosis as soon as possible, 
specifically in this case medication, but not only medication, also the psychosocial therapies. And I'm going to um, uh, end with a little bit of what the uh, COVID has done to, uh, to our patient population. Interesting what Professor De Hurt mentioned that uh, one of the first populations that needs to receive the vaccines is our patients. I, I agree 100%. Okay, so um, Hispanics, uh, when they get a severe illness like psychosis, they're already at, at a disadvantage. Uh, number one, in the US, the number of Spanish speaking psychiatrists is small. Uh, many of these patients, and unlike uh, Europe or Eastern Asia, not everybody has insurance. So uh, there's difficulty getting coverage, there's bias. Many times Hispanics don't really trust uh, the, uh, the, uh, the mental health uh, providers. So there's mistrust. So this results, of course, many hospitalizations are involuntary. Many times it is law enforcement who brings uh, people to the prison. Some get medication, some don't. Uh, there's uh, also uh, a larger degree of metabolic syndrome, getting back to the, pre the presentation of Dr. De Hurt. In fact, the, uh, the minority populations in the US, uh, lower socioeconomic status, poor diet, obesity, so more problems. So this is a, 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 including the Hispanic population, a lot of medical comorbidities. So um, this is a, I'm, I'm sure you've seen this graph before, but I wanna illustrate a couple of, uh, of issues here. So um, uh, prodromal symptoms, as we know, start years before you have the condition. So you have the prodromal symptoms, and this is when you have psychosis. So what's important is to intervene as soon as possible. Actually, there's been some studies that have suggested that uh, perhaps we should not intervene when the first psychotic symptoms start, but actually during the prodrome. It is important to uh, observe patients uh, longitudinally. And, uh, and that's why the, the importance of getting uh, patients to access, access to treatment, and also the importance of education. So um, families and teachers, they need to know the initial symptoms of psychosis so then they can refer patients to treatment and then treatment can be delivered as soon as possible. So this is a, uh, a, uh, a study that look at the advantages of early intervention uh, in psychosis, pharmacological treatment. Let's get the treatment as soon as possible. Uh, so the longer the, uh, it, it took from the first symptoms to getting the medication, the worse the outcome. So as you can see here in, uh, in blue are patients who were detected early. That means that they were referred to a specialty clinic to receive treatment, larger percentage of recovery. Now this is interesting. In this case, those who were not uh, treated early actually were living independently more frequently. But what matters is uh, the, 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 the time to recovery and functional outcomes. In psychiatry, we tend to focus on symptoms. Is the patient still hearing voices or having delusions? But what really matters to patients is, can I take care of my children? Can I go back to work and so on? So functional recovery is, is the goal. So the sooner the patient received treatment, the more likely that there was going to be good functional outcome. So um, I've mentioned the coordinated specialty care. And as I mentioned, it was initiated in New York by Kane. And uh, the main goal of the coordinated specialty care is to reduce the time of untreated psychosis with the acronym DUP. Uh, so in order to uh, do that, we need to educate not only ourselves, uh, providers, psychiatrists, but also the public and also teachers, because it's going to be fa the family and teachers, and for that matter, law enforcement, that is also key to work closely with law enforcement. So the sooner they get patients to receive treatment, the better the long-term outcome. So as I mentioned before, beautiful example of preventive medicine. So um, it's not only medication. Medication certainly works, but it works better when you have other services. So the model is ha having a multidisciplinary team 
with small caseloads, it's very important to be patient-centered. What, what do I mean by that? Or what do we mean by that? That is going where the patient is. So having community-based systems. And this is uh, actually in a way novel in North America, but not in, 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 in Europe and Anastasia. Asia. But this is something that we definitely need to increase. Uh, treatment has to be individualized. As already mentioned, there is not one best medication. Uh, so we need to make sure that we find the right medication, but also the right type of therapies. Some patients need more rehabilitation therapy than others, for instance. Uh, and another key thing is that uh, it is a partnership between patients and doctors, and we need to uh, promote recovery, resilience, and as I've mentioned, shared decision making. So it is not going to me who will provide you the medication that I think it's the best. I'll share my knowledge of different medications and we both decide what is the best treatment for you. So a um, little bit more about uh, first steps of psychosis within the Hispanic uh, population in the US. Well, the, the literacy, the, the knowledge that the Hispanics have about psychosis is, is lower than the majority white population. So this concept of duration of untreated psychosis or referring the patient for treatment as soon as possible is more of a challenge in the Hispanic population than in the white population. Uh, sometimes also um, patients feel uh, marginalized and also for that matter, caregivers. So we need to have uh, programs that focus on that population. So the same uh, uh, thing in other parts of the world where there's other minority populations or where the, uh, the, in part, the large ma majority of the population don't, don't have access to care. Uh, La Clave is a, uh, a, a, a system of care in Southern California where uh, Dr. NG lives uh, that has developed good, uh, good uh, uh, plans or good uh, uh, systems in order to get education to the Hispanic population. So um, the race study that I've mentioned a couple of times uh, had a limited number of, pa of patients who were Hispanic. Uh, as you can see, uh, it's a little bit in the, in the, in the high teens, so very small number of, of Hispanic patients. There were some interesting findings. Uh, for instance, the race and ethnicity and by the way, Hispanic is not a race, it's an ethnicity, because you can have Hispanics who are uh, Native American or, Hispanic, or Hispanics who are European or of uh, African descent. So it's, a, it's more of an, it's an ethnicity, it's not a race. Uh, but it did not, uh, in, the, in the race study, neither race nor ethnicity uh, actually determined what symptoms patients would have. Now, this is a key finding. Hispanic patients in the race study were less likely to receive a psychoeducation. And psychoeducation is key, uh, especially for episode psychosis. And uh, at least in the US, uh, early on when patients are ill, the family is very involved. When patients become chronic, the family doesn't take care of them anymore. They become homeless. Uh, I know this is different in uh, sort of Mediterranean type cultures and other culture, but in the U.S., when you have the families and first episode psychosis, so therefore the importance of educating the the family about the importance of taking medication, uh, the side effects of medication. Um, I, I work in the uh, early clinic. This is the first episode clinic at, at the University of New Mexico. And I always tell my patients that uh, in order for me to provide the best treatment, I need to be able to talk to the family, significant or the other or a, a parent, uh, whoever is the, the important person in, in order to, of course, provide psychoeducation. Another interesting thing about the uh, race study is that um, page, Hispanic patients were more likely to receive medication only and not the other therapies. And as mentioned before, a combination of treatment is what provides the best possible outcome. The problem with the, uh, the race study is that, uh, as I mentioned, few patients were Hispanic. And actually, in most studies conducted in the US, there's a small amount of, of Hispanic patients uh, because many studies, understandably, exclude non-English speaking patients. 
Uh, so this, it, it has been a challenge to get uh, data on Hispanic populations. Uh, so, and there's barriers, as I mentioned, to get involved in clinical uh, services. And also, as we know, with uh, illegal immigration, many patients don't seek treatment because they're concerned that that's going to affect their ability to stay in the U.S. Let me tell you now about our clinic. It is called the Early Clinic, and it is a coordinated specialty care. Um, uh, and, and we provide treatment here for patients with first episode psychosis. Uh, and of course, pharmacotherapy is key. And this is complemented with both individual and primary uh, therapy, very important psychoeducation. And then uh, case management is uh, people who are gonna help patients get an apartment, get the medication and so on. Uh, rehabilitation is key, getting patients back to work and peer support. Uh, those of you not familiar with the, with the word peer support, this is someone who has suffered from the condition uh, and is recovered and will help the patient better understand how to manage the condition. I, find, I have found this very helpful in first steps of psychosis patients because many of them, especially those with uh, affective psychosis, they get well, they're functioning well. Uh, they had a manic episode with psychosis, so they received treatment and they're well. But unfortunately, all medications have side effects, so then they'll stop the medication because they're doing well and then they're having the side effects. So this is where peers have been very helpful to let them know that they did exactly the same thing. And as we know, medication discontinuation is uh, muy malo. It really leads to very, very uh, poor outcomes. So peer support, very helpful in first episode psychosis clinics. Um, the, this, the study that we did, uh, and this is, uh, is what, it's trying to find out of those patients who are referred to us, how many of them do actually enroll in the program? Because getting referred to a specialty program is just the first step, but many of them do not get enrolled. Actually, we, we have a, a grant from the NIMH looking at uh, referrals from uh, 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 Univ University of New Mexico, the undergraduates refer to our clinic. As we know, psychosis is usually in college age students. So what we've proven is by having a, what we call a warm hand. In other words, as soon as the patient arrives, that they be close communication with the, the uh, clinic at the college, with us at the specialty clinic, get the family engaged. So we're proving that uh, that actually makes a lot of difference in terms of patients following up with the, <coughs> with the referral. Actually, we had uh, in, in this two, the last two years, we had almost 200 patients who were referred to us. And as you can see, uh, less than have actually enrolled. So we wanted to find out what determines for a patient to be enrolled to a specialty service or not. And in this case, we were, uh, what I'm gonna share with you today is if ethnicity or race makes a difference uh, with being enrolled once you are referred to the specialty program. So 50% um, of our patients were Hispanic, which reflects the population of New Mexico. So this is good. Patients are being referred. Uh, and also we had a good percentage of Native Americans, 7%, a little lower uh, than the, 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 the percent of Native Americans in New Mexico, it's about 10%, 6% uh, of, of uh, African American black patients. And actually this was larger. Uh, uh, New Mexico has a, a, a lower percent of, uh, of black patients or black uh, population than the rest of the country. It's about two to three percent and the rest of the country is higher. So as you can see, the referral was quite, uh, quite, quite good. So most of the patients who were referred to the clinic were Hispanics, then uh, his, uh, non, uh, whites, non-Hispanic whites, and then other minorities. So what happens to them and who refer them? So if there's one take home message uh, in my presentation, it is this one. Okay, so uh, most of Hispanic patients were referred by inpatient doctors or outpatient. That means once patients receive treatment, and of course, uh, inpatient treatment is when they're very severely ill, 
and for that matter, outpatient treatment. Now, non-physicians, uh, very low, 10%, okay? Now compare this to the white population. Most patients, this is not statistically significant, but certainly numerical, as you can see, most white patients were referred, uh, well, not, uh, not most than the providers because you have an equal number from inpatient and outpatient, for, but certainly larger 35% compared to less than 10% the Hispanic population. And as you can see with other minorities, Native American, uh, very low. This is key because as I've mentioned initially, the sooner you get treatment, the better the long-term outcome. So once you, you get to the inpatient unit, you've been ill for a long time. But if patients actually are referred by teachers, uh, by, by college, uh, um, uh, uh, in, in, the, in the dorms, they have people who look after people after the dorms, they're called tutors. So if they're referred by them, that's always good. So that really helps with uh, duration of untreated psychosis. So there's already a, an identified problem here. Just by this piece of information, I would predict that the outcome on Hispanics compared to the white population is going to be worse just by this, this uh, small piece of information. So um, what else did we find? Um, key, I am always very critical of the name, the race study, because it's uh, first episode schizophrenia. Uh, first episode psychosis changes diagnosis. In fact, most, the majority of patients with first episode have unspecified psychosis. If you have schizophrenia and other conditions, but also you have the switch of diagnosis. Patients who were initially diagnosed with, say, psychotic depression, 40% of them two years later are diagnosed with bipolar disorder or schizoaffective. So diagnosis is, is very fluid in first episode psychosis. Uh, so as you can see, most of our patients uh, uh, were um, uh, non-affective psychosis. And then we had the, as I mentioned, the unspecified psychosis and affective psychosis, psychotic depression, and, uh, and bipolar disorder. Uh, the age was, as you find in other studies, early 20s, college age students. And as you can see, uh, the majority was male as opposed to uh, female. So who enrolled in, in, in the program? Uh, so as you can see, the, uh, the many Hispanic patients uh, did uh, enroll, but that actually there was a larger percent of pa patients who did not stay in the program, larger than in the, uh, than in the white population. Um, another interesting finding is drug use. We found that um, Hispanics compared to uh, the white patients were more frequently using uh, um, illicit drugs, mostly marijuana, but also methamphetamine. Uh, and as you can see, big difference. The majority of Hispanics, which you don't see that in the in the um, in the white population. Now, um, of course, uh, when we have patients who have psychosis and it's uh, uh, induced by by drugs uh, and then recovers after a few days, so we those we don't include those patients. But many patients, the use of drugs just precipitates the condition, and certainly studies have shown that. If the, if the use of drugs certainly decreases the age of onset of psychosis. So, and the younger the age of onset, the worse the outcome. So we have an interesting finding here that Hispanic patients are more frequently using drugs compared to the, uh, to the white population. Um, so the, uh, we had a good percentage, again, compared to the race study, but this is a, a, a problem already here. So 60% of the Hispanics that not enrolled in the program compared to, actually the, it was twice as high as the white population. So we already have a problem there. Most Hispanic patients who are referred to us do not enroll in the program. So we need to do something about it in order for these patients to get uh, treatment. Um, let me uh, now move to... Uh... Now, this is another interesting finding. Patients uh, who were living in neighborhoods 
where Spanish was the main language, had actually more trouble in getting to our clinic, getting enrolled, compared to Hispanics living in, in, in neighborhoods where English was the main language. And this, of course, reflects socioeconomic status. In general, or, or most likely, uh, in, in Spanish neighborhoods are gonna be lower socioeconomic uh, status poorer than the uh, uh, English-speaking neighborhoods. So this really made a, a difference. Now, let me uh, end my, uh, my presentation with what has COVID done to our clinic. We uh, move immediately to telemedicine, uh, uh, first telephone, but audiovisual makes a big, big difference because we listen to our patients but we also observe them. So uh, we started with phone, but we immediately moved to audiovisual. Um, we made its exceptions. Uh, initially, new patients, we would see them face to face, but then we would move to audiovisual. And then uh, we were offered uh, check-ins over the phone twice a week, and, uh, and also uh, audiovisual uh, visits. Uh, we also offer our psychosocial services uh, uh, virtually. Now, um, COVID um, is, of course, a tragedy, but it does have some uh, collateral uh, opportunities. One of them is, well, this is an example that we have this, this uh, conference virtually with people from over the world, but it also has had some benefits for our patients. Uh, and, and telemedicine has been around for years, but it's not widely used. So what we found is that patients who previously declined psychosocial ser services, the therapies or education became more engaged with audiovisual because it's easier to uh, from, my, from your home just to call in and you get the education as opposed to having to go to the clinic. Another very interesting thing is that especially with, uh, with our adolescents, they came with their families and one of the reasons they would not come to the visit is because the parents had other children, so they couldn't come to the office because they had to take care of the other children. But now that it's done virtually, actually the no-shows has decreased. So we talk about the new normal. And one of the things that we're already planning is make sure that audiovisual is available, especially in a state like New Mexico. We are what we call a rural frontier state. We have many populations. I'm sure many of the uh, individuals present here in countries like uh, um, Nigeria or uh, India or Saudi Arabia, there are other areas that are rural. Uh, the way to get access to these patients is audiovisual. Also, we have a specialty um, clinic, and not every every single community in the state has that community, has that um, type of service. So we're going to increase our audiovisual services, consultation services to the rural communities. And if, again, COVID is a tragedy, but let's take advantage of this tragedy. It has definitely moved treatment. Another problem that we have in the U.S., unlike unlike other parts of the world, is that we don't have uh, treatment for all. Uh, so if you don't get the payment for the services, the services is not provided. So in the past, the payment for services was very small or non-existent. Now during COVID, uh, actually we get the, the same payment as face-to-face. As face -face. This is key. So when the American Psychiatric Association, we need to make sure that we keep those rates because in America, if providers don't get paid, they won't see the patients. So again, this would take an opportunity uh, of this uh, of finding. So let me just uh, have conclusions and uh, summarize my presentation. So Hispanics in the US are less likely to be referred to a specialty service by non-providers. That means by teachers, by family, or by law enforcement. So we need to reach out. We need to reach out and educate the public. Actually, when in the department we talk about teaching and education, it's not teach, just teaching our residents, it's actually teaching the community. So we need to do this. And of course, uh, we need to do it in Spanish. 
as you can tell from my name and my accent, I'm a bilingual person. I'm, a, I'm an immigrant from Mexico. So, so we have this advantage that we can talk to our population in Span who are Spanish speaking in Spanish. Uh, the other thing is the, the, the point that Hispanics, when they're referred to a, a specialty clinic, are less likely to go to the clinic compared to the white population. So we need to get involved right away with the, uh, with the family. And let me mention again, law enforcement. We work, you've seen in, I'm sure in the media, a lot of criticisms about the police in America and so on, we've seen it, but uh, they are key. There are many parts, part of the treatment uh, team. We need to educate them. We need to work with them. So when a patient is showing psychosis, or initial symptoms of psychosis, they're not incarcerated, they're br brought to us to the clinic. Um, so uh, we need to uh, work with the Hispanic population. And then um, the other, we need to do uh, community campaigns. The substance abuse is, is key. Uh, it, we talk about um, dual diagnosis uh, clinics, uh, that specialty clinics. The reality is that at least in America, the majority of patients with, uh, with uh, um, uh, mental illness also suffers of substance abuse. So it's the majority of our population. Uh, and then again, identify more, more strategies. So let me uh, leave you with a beautiful picture of New Mexico. We have the balloon fiesta every year in October, and that is the, the Rio Grande, not the one in the border from Mexico, but way north, the Rio Grande starts in Colorado. I actually live in a, in a community called Corrales and we have the Rio Grande nearby. So I like to jog with my son to the Rio, to the Rio Grande. Thank you, back to you, Professor Smirnova. Thank you very much, Professor Maurice Tohen. And I would uh, like to ask Professor uh, Juan Gaitan to assist with the Q and A session. Uh, well, I want to congratulate you, Dr. Mauricio Tohen. It was a lovely presentation. And I want to thank you in, in name, in representation of all Hispanic communities for helping them uh, to get a proper health care access, to, uh, a proper access to mental health care. I thank you. Now, uh, proceeding with the questions, Mapia Meta APH uh, asks, many patients drink a lot. How bad they are to their health and how we should help them cut it? Uh, is, is this question written here? Yes. Can you, can, can you repeat the question, Professor Gaitan? Okay. Many patients drink a lot. How bad they are to their health and how we should help them cut it. Okay, yeah, yeah, th uh, thank you, thank you. Yes, this is, uh, and um, COVID, COVID is bad. And actually uh, we have to deal with it. And sometimes that leads to uh, having some uh, whiskey or, or tequila, whatever is the, your favorite drink. <laughs> and this happens with our patients and actually with our colleagues. Uh, and, this is, and this is a very important role that us psychiatrists play in the medical field because uh, our, our, our colleagues need us. I've seen actually a lot of increase of, of uh, alcohol and drug use among my colleagues and actually also among our patients. So patients, uh, as, as I've mentioned before, the um, psychos psychosis is usually accompanied by substance abuse or alcohol abuse, but not only has the, the, the number of patients, but the amount of alcohol that patients are consuming. And, and we've seen this uh, recently. The other key point here is that, as I mentioned before, uh, substance abuse uh, precipitates psychosis. And the larger the amount of drugs, the more likely methamphetamine, very popular in New Mexico, and it causes a very, very bad psychosis. So I, it's a key, it's a key thing that the, that the colleague asked that we're seeing a lot of uh, alcohol and drugs that of course worsens the course of our illness and actually uh, precipitates first episode psychosis. We're seeing patients at a younger age now since COVID started. Thank you for the question. Thank you. Uh, Aliki Alenipoli asks, let me see. 
Do you have some data or comment to share with us about Native Americans' access to mental health treatment, as well as the relationship with between customary psychotropic smoking and first episode psychosis induction? Yeah, there's uh, there, there's 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 data of different substances causing uh, the um, I guess the onset of first episode psychosis. I, I don't have specific data on, on, the, on the substance that was asked, but, um, and again, let me get back to the COVID. Uh, we need to um, educate our families as we know psychosis runs in families. So when we do the psychoeducation with our person, uh, patients with first episode psychosis, uh, one of the first things that I tell the uh, parents is, this is a genetic condition. So, uh, the, the younger uh, daughter or the, or the younger sister or brother are, are at higher risk than the general population. So you should use prevention and one prevention is not using drugs. I think that is a, a very practical way to look at it. And again, younger the age, worse the outcome. Thanks for the question. I'm not sure I answered the question, but I tried. Well, and there's another question here from Solomon. Uh, Rattenmate, do, do Hispanic patients respond differently to antipsychotic medication and mood estabilizadores del ánimo compared to white patients? Yeah, uh, that's a very important question, Professor R Rivera Encinas. <laughs> thank you. I'm so sorry for my. No, no, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> there's, actually, there's actually been a lot of studies in that regard. I would say they're inconclusive, uh, but there's some, some findings. Um, actually, the first thing that, uh, that comes to mind is that sometimes uh, um, uh, psychiatrists or, or physicians try to give a larger dose when the person is larger. And, and sometimes they say, well, smaller individuals like... Uh, Hispanics or Asians might need lower doses. That's not necessarily the case. So I would first mention that. But more specifically was, do some patients respond to better medications than others? Um, I would imagine that that is going to be the case. Uh, but there's no systematic studies because I, uh, the problem is that uh, the way we pra practice pharmacotherapy, as we know, is trial and error. So we, we, it's still not um, uh, personalized. At some point, I hope in this century, genetic studies will tell us th with this particular genetic finding, you will need this particular drug. And since we all have a different genetic component, I would imagine that there's going to be differences. This is from the, uh, from the race point of view, from the ethnic point of view, which is culture. I think the difference is, is going to be with education. And you could argue uh, the data that I presented does show that medication, med pharmacological treatment is more effective in the white population in the U.S. compared to the, uh, to the Hispanic population. It has nothing to do with biology, but it is just getting the patient to get treatment and for the patient to get the, to get the education. So I think at this point I would emphasize the non-biological uh, or genetic aspects to response. I am sure that they exist, but our, our science is just very primitive. Hopefully in a few years, we'll learn more about it. Thanks for the question, okay. Professor Rivera and Sinas. Okay. Thank you. Can you hear me? Sorry, I had some connection problems. Dimitra Georgia Bansevangulo, sorry, uh, asks, why do you think Hispanics that live in uh, predominantly English-speaking neighborhoods have less, less access to mental health care services? Yeah, that is the, the sad reality of money counts. So if you have money, uh, then you're more likely to live in a community that has services. And uh, like in this country, I'm, a, I'm an immigrant, but uh, I'm an educated immigrant. So I, I'm bilingual, so I live in a nice neighborhood. But there's gonna be other immigrants who do not have, who were not as fortunate as I was that I got an education, who don't speak the language. 
and they're going to be in a poor neighborhood. And uh, not only access to service, but education uh, of that community is going to be not the same as in the uh, in the in the white neighborhoods. But it's it's mostly it's mostly socioeconomic. That would be the confounding factor. Thanks for the question, Professor Gaitan. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, Anastasia Schacht asks. There is a certain gender bias in first episode recognition. Apart from minority problematics, is this bias consistent with non-Hispanic patients in your program, or rather a specificity of Hispanic girls falling under the radar here? I see. So uh, uh, Professor Anastasia asked an interesting question, which is, uh, is there a bias? And I think the... Uh, Forgive me, if, uh, Dr. Professor Anastasia, if I'm not following the question, but you mentioned bias, and we did have 78% of Hispanics in the program, which is high. In fact, the majority of uh, the, the, the gender ratio is about one to one. That's actually a very interesting question. So, so, so next time that uh, Professor Smirnova organizes a meeting, we'll probably come up with the answer. I don't know, I will explore. Thanks for the for, thanks for the question. Agelos Mansaris asks, dear Professor Tohen, what's your opinion about first episode psychosis not related with drug use, but instead related with stimuli from social environment, for example, bullying, parental behavior, insecurities about being different, etc. And well, nurture is predisposed, but is not nurture cannot be affected in an easier way. Well, yeah, this is sort of a broad question, um, and, and it, it would have a, 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 long, a complicated answer. Everything in life is multifactorial, everything, including uh, psychiatric conditions. Uh, we know it's not all biological. When you have monozygotic twins, you don't always have um, uh, both twins being ill. But on the other hand, we have, if you have monozygotic twins, the, 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 the prevalence is larger than in the general population. But the question is, what about not only drugs, but other environmental factors such as uh, uh, trauma? Uh, I would say that the literature does show that trauma does have a strong role in psychosis. Um, I, um, I, I guess, grew up, well, I'm as an epidemiologist, mostly biological. And uh, the, it, it's difficult to understand psychosocial, psychosocial uh, factors. But what we've seen is that patients with psychosis have a larger history of trauma than patients without psychosis. And uh, New Mexico is a great place, but there's a lot of trauma. There's a lot, unfortunately, of child abuse and uh, 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 all kinds of abuse, and actually that does increase the rate. Actually, in a study that we did long ago um, when I was at McLean, uh, we did find that uh, the history of trauma is larger in psychosis compared to the general population. So my simple answer to the question is, yes, the environment matters. To what extent? Um, we'll hopefully we'll learn soon. Thank you for the question, Professor Gaitan. Okay, Professor Tohen, uh, we have many more questions, but we have a limited time slot. So I thank you for participating and well, I leave you to Darius Mirnova. Uh, for let, the let me actually thank our audience. This is a, a, well, to me, Saturday morning for many of you is a Saturday night where you could be with your families or parting out and whatever you would like to do. So thank you for being here with us today. Professor Smirnova, back to you. Thank you very much, Professor Maurice Tohen. Thank you very much for all the information, for many detailed answers, for many questions. Still, <laughs> there is a list for you. And uh, thank you very much for your additional information about geography of New Mexico. We appreciate this a lot. <laughs> and we like also the information about history and conquistador. So it's very informative for us. So thank you very much. It was very 
so no matter it's it's a night time here in Russia, uh, we are very cheerful to because of your the spirit of your presentation. Thank you very much, Professor Ma Mauricio. Thank you. Now we are moving to the next speaker, the last but not least. Um, our next presentation will be devoted to the treatment of psychosis in the Latina elderly, elderly with neurocognitive disorders. And this will be Professor Bernarda Ng from Mexico. Professor Bernarda Ng is WPA Zone 2 representative. He is the president of the Mexican Psychiatric Association, also representative of the American Psychiatric Association. Uh, Professor Bernardo Ng is medical director of Sun Valley Behavioral and Research Centers, a general director of Geriatrics Center near the Atardes uh, in Mexico. I'm sorry for pronunciation this uh, um, uh, this pronunciation, and also immediate past president uh, of the American Society of Hispanic Psychiatry. So. Um, one of the leading experts in neurocognitive disorders, and we are very honored to have Professor Bernardo Ng with us today. Uh, thank you so much. So you are sharing the screen already, we see. Thank you, Professor Smirnova. Thank you for the invitation, for organizing this. Um, it's uh, been a, a very uh, exciting uh, number of presentations. I'm very honored to be here. And, and it's always a challenge to present after my friend and mentor, Mauricio Toen. Uh, I'll try to do my best here. I, uh, I wonder, yes, yes, Mauricio, thank you. <laughs> um, um, how much time we have here? I, I think we've exceeded in time. I, uh, I'll try to do my best not to take too long. And, um, Okay, so the data I'm gonna present uh, involves uh, results from, from studies in the United States and also in some countries in Latin America. So you're gonna find some echoes with what uh, Mauricio has presented. These are my conflicts of interest. Uh, uh, of course, I receive money for research. I, I direct a research site and, and I do uh, speaking engagements for different companies, both in the US and Mexico. Uh, I'd like to show this, and, and, and I think we will agree, we will all agree with this, and the importance of having this webinars or seminars, or however you want to call it, because we need to really keep in mind the importance of where psychiatry and mental, mental health professionals are these days. Uh, I'm dividing my presentation in these four areas. Uh, we're going to start with the background. So, what is psychosis? And uh, obviously all the uh, people who've spoken here are experts in this area. And I wanted just to highlight that uh, when we're talking about psychosis in the elderly, we're not talking about schizophrenia necessarily. And, uh, and uh, there's this, this long list of, of types of psychosis. And we're going to be talking more about uh, those related to neurocognitive disorders in general medical conditions, which are very, very important in Latinos, uh, even though they've been uh, talked about already in the severely mentally ill, the uh, cardiovascular and metabolic conditions. Why is that? Well, because in the study of psychosis in the elderly, the, the, the over half of the cases will be what we want to call secondary. In very few cases will be uh, uh, late onset schizophrenia. And this study, I want to, this, this sort of uh, puts on the table what the view of my talk is going to be, which uh, is a great study. And, and uh, on this discussion about ethnicity and race that uh, Mauricio already started, um, is very interesting. In this study on, on a journal of uh, radiology, they call it an ethno-racial study. So that they don't go wrong with this one, right? Uh, they have, uh, so they, they had a, a, a comparison of patients with dementia, a group of those with European descent, those with African descent, and those with Latino descent. And they were all tested with, uh, to see if they were carriers of the APOE uh, uh, gene. And uh, interestingly, Latinos in this study 
had it positive, uh, only a quarter of the sample was positive for APOE. And then they did an analysis uh, on MRI of two cardinal findings that even though they're not definitive or clearly pathognomonic, they are suggestive of the kind of neurocognitive disorder that we're talking about. So one of them, hypocampal atrophy as a representative of Alzheimer's disease. And on the other side, white, white matter hyperintensities as representatives of vascular component of, of that dimension. And look at this, even though there was a mixed a mixture of findings uh, in every subsample. Clearly, in the Latino population or the Latino subgroup, it was more weighted around or on the side of white matter hyper hyperintensities, meaning a vascular component. And this is where the rest of the talk is is going to reflect about the importance of considering the vascular component in uh, any of our patients with neurocognitive disorders, either psychotic or not. Okay, so, you know, this is, this is from the textbook, the assessment of the six Ds on a elderly patient with psychosis. And of course, here, I'm starting to introduce that in the patient with dementia, either with depressive symptoms or with depression or with psychosis or with schizophrenia, we need to already keep in mind the metabolic factor which has, which in this case for the Latino population is very important in the case of diabetes. Why am I saying that? Uh, uh, because in this complex, it's, it's very hard to see a Latino elderly with dementia and psychosis and not think about the other D, which is disease. And this is only to, to give you uh, an approximation of how Latinos in the United States are by large the ethnic group with the highest prevalence of diabetes across these four ethnic groups. African-American are very close, but yes, more than one in every five Latinos in the US have diabetes. Okay, so how does that reflect on patients with schizophrenia? Let, let's talk about that for a moment and then get it out of the way because I'm not gonna be talking about schizophrenia anymore. And this is uh, some features, both clinical and demographic, of early onset schizophrenia versus late onset schizophrenia versus very late onset schizophrenia, right? So the prevalence decreases as uh, we go up there in age. But the more important thing, and this is trying to connect with the part of uh, pharmacology, okay, is that the risk, even on schizophrenics, of tardive dyskinesia increases with age. So uh, it's, it's, at the end of the talk, you're gonna think that what I'm trying to say is not to prescribe antipsychotics, but it, it's something like that, okay? And even in schizophrenic patients, late on, very late onset schizophrenia, be very, very careful because of the risk of tardive dyskinesia. Okay, so now we go more into psychosis of dementia and schizophrenia some clinical uh, uh, pearls, which I think are very interesting. If you have a patient who is uh, older and is psychotic, the chances for it to be schizophrenia are very, very low compared for it to be secondary uh, to something else, right? Um, and some of the features is bizarre and complex delusions are very rare on the patient with dementia. Features like misidentification is very frequent. Visual hallucinations are more common in the elderly than in the young person. The Schneiderian first rank symptoms of schizophrenia are very rare. Past history of psychosis will also be very rare. And uh, the remission of the psychotic symptoms is frequent. And this is also very important as to the decision on how long to keep the patient on an antipsychotic. Therefore, is recommended to be uncommon. And another thing that is very important from the clinical point of view is that unless the psychotic symptoms, be that delusions or hallucinations, are really, really causing or linked to disruptive behaviors in the elderly, you don't need to treat with medications. And what I'm, I'm going to give an example of a, a patient that um, uh, her family was very worried because she would see children 
um, uh, coming to visit her every morning. And uh, they wanted me to medicate her. And, and, you know, and I'll say, wait, wait, why is that? So the patients would come visit her. Like, there were like four to six children. They would come and sing with her and dance with her. So she was happy every time she hallucinated, right? And I was able to establish that it did not disrupt her meals. It didn't make her sleep less or eat less. So we were really conservative until eventually the hallucinations went away without having to prescribe medication. Okay, so here we are extending the differential diagnosis with delirium, Alzheimer's disease, Lewy body disease and depression and only to mention and highlight, don't forget the possibility of Lewy body disease when you have early visual hallucinations for two reasons. One is very hard to treat very, very hard to treat those hallucinations. And unless they're really causing disturbance in the patient's behavior or the patient's well-being or the patient's peace of mind, be very careful with what antipsychotic you prescribe because these patients are very sensitive to Parkinsonian symptoms and dystonias. And you don't wanna cause another problem like gait disturbances that would lead to falls or problems getting out of bed that would lead to bed sores. Okay, recommendations. First of all, make a very, very good assessment, okay? So very important when the patient comes in psychotic, past history. Ha is this the first time the patient is exhibiting delusions or hallucinations uh, or not? Because that's quickly gonna lead you to either the possibility of primary schizophrenia or secondary psychosis. And here I'm gonna uh, take on uh, some of the things that Mauricio mentioned. Many times I've had patients who've been psychotic before, but the family never considered it a psychotic disorder, right? Because um, when there is a, a psychotic symptoms or even schizophrenia with, with low symptoms, it is tolerated in some families. And this has to do, and it and, and makes a lot of sense with the connection that was making Mauricio about the first onset. Many Hispanic families or Latino families don't see it as something, and I, I don't, and I want to get away from the word normal or abnormal, but something that can improve with some with treatment and prevent further deterioration or complications. So be careful when you're taking history because sometimes um, uh, un, until you you go very systematically asking for symptoms and level of function, you don't realize that we have patients who've been schizophrenics all their lives. And, and, and now it, it, when the neurocognitive deterioration comes on, becomes more evident or more disruptive with aggressive behaviors or other kinds of behaviors. Okay, so once you get that, if there was a history before, you wanna compare with what symptoms the patient had before and especially with what treatments worked before. And if that's the case, treat it with that, no more to it. But in the other case, if it goes to the right side, you definitely, definitely have to carry on a medical and neurological workup. The patient deserves it. Um, you may find out not only that the patient is carrying on uh, the, the, the development of a central nervous system, degenerative disease, but sometimes you find out other conditions. I mean, maybe the, the point when you realize that the vascular disease of the patient has cardiovascular disease or metabolic disease, not until you do that. Something that you cannot let go, no matter how old the patient is, assessment for substance abuse, okay? Medications and also non-prescribed uh, substances. Among the Latinos, alcohol is high. It's, uh, I mean, like uh, Mauricio was saying, about not only about um, the population in general, but even in our profession. And now with the quarantine, yes, the consumption of alcohol has increased considerably. And of course, see if the workup is positive for a medical condition, treat the medical condition. If a substance use is suspected, stop the offending agent. And after that, make the uh, assessment for the cognitive impairment. Uh, one thing to highlight is that on the screening tests for cognitive impairment, Latinos in the US frequently score worse and there is already a well-established direct relationship with level of education. So you have to be very careful on that and never forget level of functioning because if you only focus 
on the results of your neuropsychological testing, Latinos will do worse in general. And then uh, if that's the case, you treat the neuropsychiatric symptoms of dementia. And that's where I'm gonna focus the rest of my, uh, my talk at this point. So if it turns out that the patient does not show evidence of cognitive impairment, then yes, it brings us back to the possibility that it's a primary psychotic disorder like schizophrenia and boom, we go back to the left side to treat uh, as we would uh, take uh, treating schizophrenia even in a younger patient. Okay, so the treatment I'm gonna divide it in three parts. And of course, now we're getting schizophrenia out of the way. And uh, we're gonna talk about environmental and psychosocial treatments, the treatment of comorbid conditions. And until the very end, we're gonna talk about psychopharmacology. Uh, there is evidence level two on cognitive behavioral social skills training. This is very interesting. As uh, Professor Smirnova mentioned, I'm, I'm the director of a geriatric center that we have in Mexico. And the main thing that, that keeps us going is this kind of therapy with social skills training, with uh, um, cognitive stimulating activities. All of the activities are in group, which has been a big, big challenge now with the pandemic. In fact, we've had to close visitations uh, for the greater of three months, one first phase. And as we were opening the visitations again under very restrictive measures, we've had to close it again in order to prevent people from the outside coming into the center uh, so that our residents living at our facility have the freedom to continue interacting among themselves without having to wear a mask or, or other protection. So we, we make like this bubble, at least we hope to protect them from the virus, but that their activities continue uh, with, uh, we use music, uh, we, go, we use gymnastics, we use yoga, and, and that definitely helps uh, even not only with psychotic symptoms, but with other symptoms. And the other one, no doubt, no doubt. I mean, it's uh, I, as uh, they were mentioning already, uh, we are physicians, right? And we need to keep that in mind. And even if we're not experts in treating diabetes, we need to make sure that we help identify it, that we connect our patients to the uh, uh, right physician to help with prescriptions. But it doesn't mean we cannot guide our patients on eating better, doing exercise, the importance of checking their glycemic levels. Uh, and, uh, and there's a clear relationship, as I mentioned on that imaging study before. So we're gonna go with medications now. Okay, first of all, it's not an antipsychotic I'm gonna talk about, right? The Nepocil. Uh, the, the group of uh, Dr. Cummings uh, published in 2016, a re-evaluation of the results of the various studies that were published for even a decade before on the constellation of delusions, agitation, anxiety, disinhibition, and irritability. First thing I want to mention here is very hard to find a study on any medication which is exclusively directed to treating psychotic symptoms. You're, you're usually going to find something with agitation with disinhibition and irritability. And this is very interesting because for some reason you seem to cover both the paranoid kind of psychosis and the manic kind of psychosis. Anyway, in this study or this collection of studies, what uh, the group of Dr. Cummings proposes or found is that in studies from 12 to 24 weeks, the episode was def definitely better than placebo and that's good but not always useful in the real clinical world. Because if the patient is really agitated or getting aggressive or disinhibited, you're not gonna wait 12 weeks for the patient to get better. So frequently you're gonna have to add an antipsychotic, but here's the important part. They were able, and on, on, on a separate data on the same paper, they mentioned how when you do combine the nepocils with an antipsychotic, in this case, the study was with perfenazine, you end up getting positive results with lower dosages. So even if that's the only benefit on adding a cholinesterase inhibitor, in this case, the nepocil is worth it because you expose the patient to less of, uh, uh, of the burden of using an antipsychotic in this age group. Uh, similar study by another group, this is by DeSanto, 
they did a meta-analysis of 40 randomized controlled trials on the effect on, re on improving uh, or decreasing uh, disruptive behaviors. And memantine was actually uh, the one that scored better. Rivastigmine did not separate from placebo. The nepocil and galantamine did. What does that mean? Uh, and this is very interesting because memantine has very strong data on vascular dementia, maybe even better than with Alzheimer's disease. So was it that this patient had, uh, or among these patients, uh, there were patients with a vascular component that was not appreciated before? But honestly, uh, the, the message of this slide is that if you have a patient with neurocognitive deficits and psychotic symptoms, do not forget to add an anti-dementia agent. And this is uh, here uh, for some reason, and, and the paper does not explain it, but very likely will be for reasons that Mauricio already mentioned about cultural, ethnic issues and socioeconomic issues. But it seems that the uh, treatment or the use of cholinesterase inhibitors and memantine is lower than on the non-Hispanic whites in the United States. Why do we forget to treat these patients with uh, an anti-dementia agent. And here are the scores compared to using uh, for whites as number one, blacks goes down to 0.59 for cholinesterase inhibitors, 0.43 for memantine, and for the non-black Hispanic, 0.8 uh, with cholinesterase inhibitors and basically 0.7 uh, with uh, memantine. At least, at least is, is, is closer but is, is not, uh, is lower. Okay, and what's the issue with antipsychotic medication in the elderly with dementia? We've been familiar with this since over 10 years ago, and um, uh, there's been a lot of debate uh, if it's true or, or not, or how true this is. The reality is that we don't have other options. That's the problem. Uh, for the acute control of someone, um, psychotic, and if we already went through all these algorithms that I uh, presented to you before, then uh, it comes down to, if you have to use it, use it, but at least take this in consideration. Do not use it for more than three to six months. If the, if the symptoms get resolved sooner, I'll tell you in a moment what to do. Uh, typical, keep in mind, tardive dyskinesia risk is higher in this population. A typical antipsychotics metabolic risk, no, no doubt about it, in, in very, very important given that this population, the Latino elderly already come with a higher risk or a higher burden of metabolic risk. Dose in general, across the board, start with half of the recommended dose. In some cases will be even less. However, that doesn't mean that you shouldn't go up to the full dose if the symptom control requires it. Um, starting low doesn't mean stay low. Okay. These are some uh, dose levels on major neurocognitive disorder, both uh, patients with Alzheimer's disease and vascular uh, dementia. And uh, the ones that have the, the, the most uh, robust evidence is risperidone, quetiapine, and olanzapine. Ipiprazole, not so. Uh, Amisopride, it's in the middle. And, and this is interesting because there is a divergence between um, evidence and, and clinical experience, right? I personally like her so a lot, but uh, is the one with the least evidence. And uh, it, it, with that only to, to second what Maurice said a moment ago, uh, is trial and error and uh, we need to improve on our abilities, uh, our capacities to do personalized medicine. Okay. Now uh, I'm gonna switch a little bit here to what are we doing wrong, okay? So the next couple of slides have to do with a, an evaluation of antipsychotic prescriptions by ethnicity, okay? And here we are, Hispanics versus white and African-Americans versus white. This was a study of more than four, almost 5,000 prescriptions, okay? With the diagnosis or patients with neuropsychiatric symptoms. And in every case, the minority patients were prescribed antipsychotics more so than um, non-minority patients, okay? 
And in some cases, it was almost double, 1.72, okay? So that raises a question, okay? Why, what are we not doing? Or what are we taking for granted that the Latinos get prescribed antipsychotics more frequently than the non-Latino or, or non-minority patients? Another study, very similar, this with almost 9,000 uh, participants, and again, is more than one and a half times the, the, this is the odds ratio for if you're Hispanic to end up a prescribed an antipsychotic. Okay, uh, just to, um, to, that's about the, the Latinos with the metabolic component, why it's important to try to not use antipsychotics when it turns out we're using more so than with non-Hispanics. Uh, just a couple of comments. We do have an FDA-approved uh, medication, primavanserin, for psychosis related to Parkinson's. I didn't want to uh, go without mentioning that. And with Lewy body dementia, the, the challenge of prescribing clozapine, um, because is the, at least in theory, would be the ideal medication to prescribe on patients who are so sensitive to Parkinsonian symptoms. However, the challenge is the general medical condition of the patient and, and the frequent uh, blood drawing and the risk of a granulocytosis. Okay, so I told you I was going to talk about this. When to stop antipsychotics, right? So you, you have the patient, you, 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 you already gave him either donepacil or memantine or the combination of both. The, the, the antipsychotic has been on board for about 12 weeks. What do you do now? Well, it turns out there is no evidence on how to get the patient off the antipsychotic. What most of us do is a gradual reduction. I think that's the most important thing. How you do it, how fast you do it, it depends on your experience, but don't forget to get the patient off the antipsychotic. So this is my, my last slide, psychosis in the Latino elderly. It's a complex clinical condition. It requires careful assessment. Don't forget that at least with Latino elderly, the high, high likelihood that a metabolic condition will coexist and top of, of, of the list will be diabetes mellitus type two. Uh, Non-medications measures are preferred over medication management. Uh, keep in mind that antipsychiatry may be overprescribed among Latinos and uh, this treatment is not recommended for long periods of time. Thank you very much. Uh, it's been a really enlightening presentation. Thank you very much. What you described is what I would consider a very complex clinical challenge regarding treatment of psychotic episodes in dementia patients. Uh, thank you very much for the insight. Well, as for the public, uh, well, Dimitra Giorgio Vaxivangelo and mentions that if you have any pointers about treatment of geriatric depression. Oh yeah, well, no, uh, depression and dementia is all another, another presentation, which is very complex. Um, especially in the early stages of neurocognitive disorder, uh, depression becomes uh, the, the most important challenge to differentiate and um, uh, it goes along the, 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 the same lines as far as the diagnosis. Is it first episode depression or is it a recurrent depression, right? And uh, uh, there is debate as if depression appearing for the first time, if it is going to be a prodrome of dementia, really, or it's an overlap of the two disorders. Uh, in any instance, I personally always like to give the patient the, the benefit of the doubt and treat the depression aggressively. And only if the uh, concomitant cognitive symptoms do not improve, then move on to uh, treatment as a neurocognitive disorder. But that, that's me. It's not, it's, it's the clinical uh, um, road that I've taken uh, only because I still consider that even new onset depression can be reversible uh, and, and, and have to give that benefit to the patient to go through that treatment. Okay, I have a question of, of my own and 
What do you think about using memantine in mild cognitive impairment? <laughs> okay, now you can. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's uh, well, the short answer is there is no evidence, right, uh, to prove or support the use. But I think as clinicians, many of us, especially when we've had patients that uh, we've known for a long time with another primary psychiatric disorder, and when they start exhibiting symptoms of cognitive decline, um, and if the patient agrees, we do it. I think the evidence that it might harm is, is also present, and you have to weigh one against the other. Um, and I, I think it's, it's the individual case. Uh, across the board, there is no evidence to support it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, well, I think that's all the questions we have Thank you. for now. So I'm back to the area. Thank you very much, Professor. And I hope we can work in another events in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Juan Gaitan, for assisting with this uh, question and answers session. Thank you very much, Professor Bernardo NG, for amazing presentation. It's very difficult topic in psychiatry. And I like so much that you use this uh, cognitive and social group interventions because it's very important uh, for elderly, uh, not just Latino elderly, but for all uh, geriatric um, patients. And of course, we need to think about psychogeriatric uh, 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 brigades or clinics, uh, memory clinics for uh, uh, such uh, like they have in uh, United Kingdom, for example. And of course, the social psychosocial interventions are uh, very, very important. Um, uh, I would like to ask if you use uh, these group sessions for like Zoom meetings with them or, uh, or with your patients, is it possible? Uh, because of pandemic, could you uh, try yeah. with this online sessions video? Uh, yeah. Yes, we have. I'm 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 still affiliated to in um, on the U.S. side in the California side with the um, center which is called Alegria. See, it is in the United States, but the name is in Spanish, right? Because yeah. of the similar ethnic diversity uh, described by Mauricio, but here in California. And this is an outpatient program where, where people come from their homes on a daily basis. But since the pandemic started, we, we've not been able to do that. So they're contacted by phone every day by our staff. And, and the materials of where to draw or collar and stuff, they're, they're delivered to their home. So they continue doing it. And the family members are being guided. Uh, you know, they have, it's a phone session, tell them what to do, and then follow up uh, once to twice a week. But on the Zoom part, uh, I also have to add that it has not been as easy with this population, this elderly population, for two reasons. One, coverage is not uniform in the county. It's a spread county. Uh, uh, is, um, is large in surface, but not that populated. And this is California. It's not New Mexico, but it's a similar environment. And so the coverage uh, of the signal is not as good in all areas. And then the devices, you require certain devices. So the poor are not able to buy the devices that can have, can allow you these communications effectively. So that has been a challenge and most of it is done by phone. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, I understand of course, uh, and uh, devices and access to these devices in this uh, population. Thank you very much for your answer, Professor Bernarda and G. And um, now we are going to the end of the webinar and I see Professor Abzal Javed is still with us and maybe would like to say a uh, few words because yes we will receive uh, certificates um, after the meeting and i would like to thank uh, uh, all the speakers and uh, organizers and support of the wpa for this webinar and also uh, mr georgios psatas from let's study greece who assisted us with all these uh, technical issues to arrange this meeting so to all the panelists, to all the speakers and faculty, and Professor Javed, 
you are our leader of WPA. Can you yeah. uh, finish Thank you. the meeting? Thank you very much, Daria. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Daria. And I once again thank you and uh, the co-organizers uh, and more importantly, our dear friend Kostros for gathering such an excellent speakers. I, I tell you honestly, this is really a sort of a gem of uh, experts that uh, they have spoken to us. And uh, uh, it, it is not only for Latin America, it is for whole of the world. And uh, we really appreciate uh, the way they were very clear in their deliberations. Most of the uh, talks were clinically oriented because what we get the feedback from the WPA meetings, webinars, seminars, people say that, look, research and science is very important. But what is more important is that when you are sitting in your clinic, then you have to make a decision that should really be based on evidence-based, but at the same time, that should tailor the needs of the patient you are seeing. So thank you very much, all the speakers. and. Uh, if I take this liberty to request, especially to two people, Bernardo and Costos, who are our zonal representative, this is one of the excellent uh, idea that we, the board, the zonal board, uh, through both of you, should really try to do some webinars, what you can call interzonal webinars. You can have, you can divide these into different time zones so that that will facilitate. I mean, at the end of the day, there will be only three major groups, uh, Americans, European, African, some part of Asian and the East Asian or the Southeast Asian. So this is one suggestion. The second one, which if uh, Costos agrees, and of course, if Bernardo also supports me, that uh, we have recently started our educational portal on WPA website. This is, uh, we are in the, in the phase of setting it up. It will be set up during the next few weeks. We want to make it a resource place, a source for the, like a library source. So yeah. that these talks, these uh, uh, very important uh, uh, presentations, if we could really have the permission of the speakers, and if the organizers are recording these webinars, we will be more than happy to really request that we could add them to the WPA website. This is my, my plan that uh, in the area of education and especially using this telepsychiatry, these innovative ways, we should and we could develop a very, very big uh, sort of resource uh, library in our website. And what I plan to do is that, and that I will come back to, especially our four uh, zonal representatives from Latin America, that we want to establish these resource centers uh, based on linguistics. So for example, we are planning to, to, to set up a, a resource center, especially for Russian and related languages. One for English, one for Spanish, one for Chinese, so that uh, at least these five, six major languages are covered in terms of our education and training. And I will need uh, Bernardo and Costa's help while they are uh, wearing the hat of the zonal representative. So please do let us know that uh, if we could really use and disseminate these presentations in a big way. I hope that uh, you can always get permission from the speakers. And I honestly felt so pleased, uh, especially uh, looking at uh, the questions, the, the, the questions that were coming. That really showed questions coming from South Africa, questions coming from Russian side, from Europe, from Latin America. This is truly, I don't, I don't want to take the credit from Costos or from the speakers, but I feel that this is WPA. This is, the, <laughs> this is what WPA showed. So I hope that the speakers and the organizers won't mind that if I just take some credit. 
or at least at least being more ambitious and uh, so so with these words i really want to thank you and uh, thank you very much and we hope that we look forward receiving more news more presentations more activities from your end thank you very much